Hi there, I'm Ryan Chandler. Here's your talking points for this week. Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick rolled through Lubbock this week to make the case that he's the best candidate to handle property taxes, public education, and the power grid. We'll sit down with him for his only local interview of this election cycle. While well, statewide candidates like Patrick are especially focused on West Texas this year, veteran politics reporter Jeremy Wallace has been all over the state covering the campaigns, and he says our votes just might make all the difference. We'll talk with him for an insider's take. From the studios of KMAC Television in Lubbock, your local election headquarters, this is Talking Points. And thanks for joining us. New polling from the Texas Politics Project shows Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick leading by seven points as he seeks a third term as Texas's top legislator. But with one in five Texans saying that they're still undecided in that race, Patrick said that he's not taking anything for granted as his bus tour rolled through Lubbock. He sat down with us to talk through the most important issues this week in what is, as far as I can tell, the only one-on-one -on -one -on -one local interview given so far by the most powerful man in Texas. You've made your way out through a lot of small towns in rural Texas recently. Why do you think it's important during this cycle to get out here and talk to the people in, in rural Texas, which is traditionally a, a Republican stronghold? Sure. So every, every election, 14, when I first ran for lieutenant governor and 18, I've always campaigned in rural Texas, but not at this level. And so we have a double-decker bus. Uh, we get about six miles to a gallon of Joe Biden's expensive gas. I guess we have a 150-gallon tank, 900 miles, you know, $900 a day we spend roughly. And we plan and we'll, we'll commit that we're going to finish the plant, 130-plus cities in rural Texas. Uh, we've already done about 35 by the time today ends. We do eight or nine a day, depending on the day, uh, be, for a couple of reasons. Uh, we cannot allow Texas to become California. And the issues that... And I'm not trying to be partisan here, it's just the issues are different. The other side does not line up with the values of West Texas, Central Texas, and rural Texas. And if you look at Texas, we're like a lot of states, like Ohio's all red except Cleveland, and Cincinnati, and Pennsylvania's all red except Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. So Texas is all red, pretty much, except for about 20 counties or so, but they're the, some of the big ones, uh, Dallas and Bear County and Harris County, where Houston is, and Travis County. And so those big cities compromise about 50% of the vote, roughly. The other 230 to 235 rural counties comprise the other 50%. And there are some people that we're going to win. I have great confidence that Greg Abbott will win, I'll win, and we'll do very well. But we take nothing for granted. And Beto O'Rourke is going to have unlimited money. And so we have to go out there and make sure that people in rural Texas understand that they're important, their vote's important. We have to win by a big margin. So our goal is to recognize that to galvanize the folks and to mobilize the vote. And, that, and that's how we win. Well, your opponent, Mike Collier, has come through town to, to some of these other uh, rural cities across Texas recently. And the pitch he is making is, is one he believes that uh, will, will be uniquely apt to the people of West Texas. He talks about your record on property taxes, on public education, and on the power grid. Um, and, and that has earned him a, a couple of Republican endorsements, one just up, uh, up north in the panhandle in Amarillo. You've been a, a vocal proponent of school vouchers. He says that's going to disproportionately harm rural Texas. Well, how, how will you make that case to, to first of all, voters now, here? My opponent, Mike Collier, he was a senior advisor to Joe Biden. He says publicly that there's no daylight between him and Joe Biden. I don't think Lubbock or West Texas or Texas wants to vote for a local Joe Biden as a lieutenant governor. He is for repealing photo voter ID, which he says he'll do. Uh, we passed a bill that boys can't play girls sports. He thinks that's wrong. He wants to repeal that bill so that boys can play girls sports. We don't think that's right. He wants to demolish the oil and gas industry and he wants to keep the border open because again, his words, not mine, Joe Biden's policies are pragmatic and good for Texas. That's just a joke. It's a joke and the people of Texas aren't gonna buy it. Uh, in terms of public education, let me tell you what, I'm proud of my record. Uh, we have, under my leadership, we have put more money into public education than any lieutenant governor in history. In 2019, it was about $11 billion, which included a pay raise for teachers, which is the most and highest pay raise they've ever gotten. Uh, I promised I'd do it, and we delivered on that. Each school district could use the money, how, I mean, decide which teachers got the raise, but it was $2 billion set aside 
just for teachers. So we're a strong proponent of education. Look, public education. My wife's a longtime school teacher. Uh, we have 1,200 school districts in Texas. About 900 of them have less than 2,000 kids. Rural Texas, and it's not about vouchers. You know, the Democrats like to use that word. But, oh, it's, in fact, Mike Collier said vouchers are for vultures. That's what he called parents who want freedom of choice and the, you know, parental rights. Uh, that was, those were, that's how he closed the speech at the convention. Vouchers are for vultures. I don't think parents are vultures, but that's what the Democrats believe. And so we're going to protect all the rural schools. We're not going to, they're not going to lose any money. Where we need, we need options for parents, particularly is in our inner cities where we have a tremendous dropout rate, failing schools. We cannot have a state of two classes of citizens, those that have a public education or an education and those who do not. So uh, they just like, you know, it's just, they like to pull that out every year. So look, Mike Collier would be a disaster as Lieutenant Governor because look, Lieutenant Governor of Texas is the most powerful legislative position in the country of any legislature. Um, just like Beto O'Rourke would be a disaster as governor. Hmm. We're going to, into this session yep. with uh, a surplus. Yes, 27 billion projected. Right, can we, uh, institute a program for uh, private and, and charter school vouchers while maintaining the level of public education that we have now or, or increasing right. it more? How do we do both of those things? Well, it's not a voucher. It's saying to a parent, do you believe the money allocated for their child, should they have a say in that? And again, we're going to protect rural schools. So don't buy into their argument uh, and, and, their, and their propaganda. That's just not what it's about. Uh, it's for our biggest school districts where we have real, real problems. Look, we have some failing schools in, in rural Texas as well, but most of the schools in rural Texas are pretty good. And so they need not to be concerned about that. But then when, and when my opponent, Mike Collier, says, well, we haven't done anything on property taxes, stop. Uh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Number one, the homestead exemption was $15,000 when I became lieutenant governor. It's 40000 today. That alone saves every taxpayer. They take 40000 off the top of the price of their home. They don't have to pay taxes on it. Next session, we'll take it to $55,000. We'll get it to 100000 Mike Collier doesn't have a clue how to pass a bill, more or less do something as complex and complicated as that. Talking about public education, yes. another issue at the top of every parent's mind is, of course, school safety. Exactly. Our representatives here have uh, led the charge in getting to the bottom of what happened in Uvalde, Dustin Burroughs over on the House yes. side. Done a good job on that. Senator Perry, uh, you, you had appointed to, yes. to uh, on, on the committee in, in the Senate side to deal with yes. school safety. Uh, I'd be interested to hear what uh, the conversations are that you've had with the Uvalde community and, and school officials recently about what they would like to see done. Of course, n none of that will happen until the next session, but when you think about school safety going into the 88th, what priorities will you tell uh, the Senate to focus on? So in 2018, I believe it was, the Santa Fe shooting, because I was close to that Houston school, that's where I live when I'm not in Austin, uh, I was there, one of the first people on the scene, and the immediate thing I saw that day, when we had a press conference later that afternoon, was we have to secure every entrance. We have too many entrances and exits in schools. We have to secure those. Um, you have to have automatically closing doors that lock behind you. We can't be leaving doors open. And then uh, my wife and I donated money to buy uh, metal detectors, and I got the company who makes them to put up the rest, because I wanted to make the Santa Fe school model for metal detectors to see how they work. So you have one entrance in, one entrance out. It's worked, it's been very fluid, and it's now how it works, and they've been very happy with that. Um, we put in money after that to pay for teachers to be trained if they want to carry, and if the school district allows it. So, but here's the deal. I don't want to tell a school district and the parents and the school board what to do in 1,200 school districts and 9,000 campuses. There are parents who don't want metal detectors and school boards. Okay, they don't want them, then that's their option. There are parents and school boards who don't want their teachers armed. Most of the bigger counties don't want that. But in your smaller counties, they've got to have the teachers armed. And we pay to train them. We put $100 million into school security after the Santa Fe shooting. And when the Uvalde shooting happened, there was still about $14 million that the schools had never tapped. So some of the schools didn't realize they had more. And so that money is there. And then after the Uvalde shooting, one of the things we learned quickly is they didn't have the ballistic shields. They said they were waiting. They should have never waited the hour, but they said they didn't have the ballistic shields early. So already I've put $50 million in. I already had it approved by the governor and the speaker. I appreciate their support. So every school district will have ballistic shields so that if that ever happens again, um, uh, there are ballistic shields. So there are no more excuses about going in. There shouldn't have been any excuses anyway, but that 50 million I've already put in. And that's something we're able to do, the governor, the speaker, myself, 
in a, you know, outside a session. So we're going to do everything we can. Parents have a right. I've got seven grandkids. Well, my grandkids go to school. I, I want to know they're safe. I want everybody's child to be safe. All right, Lieutenant Governor Patrick, thank you for coming down to the South Plains and, and sharing your message. Cool. Hey, for, for, for a, an intern in the Texas Senate just three years ago, you pretty, did a pretty darn good job of an interview. Thanks, sir. Appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> well, when we come back, we'll zoom out and talk about why West Texas could, could be the tipping point for statewide races like the Lieutenant Governor's with ACE political reporter Jeremy Wallace.